Hey everybody, welcome back to Warpaint Off-Road. I'm Dan, and this video is gonna serve as your one-ton encyclopedia. What you need to expect, what it's gonna drive like, some of the difficulties, some of the things nobody talks about, and what axles are truly the easiest, best axles to swap into your rig. All the stuff right here, one video coming at you. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything else that's gonna be important for your build. And guys, let's check it out. I promise you I'm not going to stand in front of this whiteboard the entire time, but I do need to give you guys a bunch of information. And the first thing we're going to tackle is if you even need one ton axles. One ton axles are great, but do you really need one ton axles? Here's the deal. They look cool. Yes! And they allow you to run a really big tire reliably. That's awesome! But if you're not running a 40 inch tire, you don't need them. This is obviously a one ton axle. You can tell because it's got eight lug nuts going all the way around and it says Ford in the middle of it. I have one ton axles on this rig with 40s because I take it off road and I wheel some pretty big stuff and I want the reliability of being able to either get it back on a trailer or drive it home at the end of the day and then maybe take my kids to school or cruise around town. If you're not ever going off road, you can run 40s on something like a Dana 44. If you have a Dana 30 in the front of your rig, so if your rig is not a Rubicon, or you didn't swap in a Dana 44 in place of your Dana 30, I would not run 40s. But if you have a Dana 44 and you wanna run a 40 and not go off-road, you can do so fairly reliably. You're gonna to have to upgrade your brakes. You're definitely gonna to have to upgrade your steering and you're gonna to have to make sure that it's safe. You're gonna to have to reliably maintain your vehicle because bigger tires put more strain on all of your components. I don't recommend running that big of a tire on a factory-ish axle or a factory modified axle, but there are plenty of people do. And if you're keeping it on road, the stress on that axle is way less than taking it off road and it'll probably survive a decent enough time. But everybody that actually goes off-road is gonna look at you and they're gonna know you don't. Game over, bitches. But guys, if you absolutely wanna to switch to a one-ton axle, you're gonna to have to do it right. Now, you don't have to build your own axles for your Jeep. You could wind up buying them from a place like Fusion 4x4. They make amazing axles. The only problem with a place like Fusion 4x4 is the cost of those axles. Uh, you're talking, you know, upwards of $20,000 for a set of one-ton axles. Oh, God! <laughs> you still haven't bought wheels, tires, suspension, drive shafts, or the stuff to make all your brakes work. So it can be extremely expensive. And if you're willing to try and build these at home, it's really not that difficult as long as you know how to weld or a friend can weld. Let's dive on in. Let's talk about the one ton axles you need if you're gonna tackle this yourself and how exactly you can make them all work on your vehicle. And the one ton axle that you're gonna to wanna to switch to in the front of your rig is gonna be a 99 to 2016 F250 or F350 axle. Why? Because it's got the most aftermarket support. Warpaint behind me over here has one of those axles underneath it. It's a Dana 60, which means it's got a really big ring and pinion, really big axle tubes, bearings, axle shafts, all that kind of stuff to handle the abuse of one of these big tires. If you go pre-2005, you go 99 to 04, you're dealing with a couple of different issues. Number one, the axles aren't as strong. And number two, you're often not even sold a Dana 60, you're sold a Dana 50. Now the Dana 50 is still a decently strong axle for a light enough rig, but you need to know that you don't have a Dana 60 before you start buying replacement parts for it. And here's how you can tell. 
If you look real closely at a Dana 60 and a Dana 50 differential, as shown in this photo here, you can tell that one has kind of a smooth area on it and one has a hump on the casting. So make sure you take a look. Because even if someone tells you it's one of these later year axles, oftentimes it's not. The axle's out of the vehicle, the current owner, God knows where they got it from. They might just be lying to you, but even if they think they're telling you the truth, how do we really know what vehicle it came out of? So make sure you do your homework and make sure you know what you're buying because it will affect the parts that you're going to buy later. And you probably don't want a Dana 50, especially if you think it's a Dana 60. One of the other reasons you don't want that earlier axle usually is because of the parts it came with from the factory. This axle is out of an 05 to 16 vehicle. And the reason I went with that for war paint is because, again, I knew I off-roaded it. And here is the main reason why you'd want to do it. The knuckles, the part on your steering that actually your wheel bolts to, your bearing, your brakes, all that kind of stuff, is actually going to be beefier on the 2005 and up model than it was prior. The outer axle shafts, the part that actually connects in here to your locking hub, is going to have 35 splines. It's about an inch and a half diameter and the earlier ones only were 30 spline now the earlier ones did have a 35 spline inner and so do these newer ones but the outer was only a 30 spline so it was definitely a weak point they also had smaller brakes than the later ones upgraded locking hubs there are some aftermarket options that are much stronger but these have been strong enough for me so far i'll eventually upgrade them to the aftermarket ones when these fail but they haven't failed yet so Maybe I won't. But one of the benefits to having that earlier axle is that it's set up for leaf springs. So if your vehicle, the vehicle you're swapping it into, you're going to run leaf springs, that might be easier. If you're not going to run leaf springs, it's a lot easier even still because there's a lot less to cut off that axle tube than cutting it off of the later model Dana 60. Now I do have a video out that you can see right here that's going to explain exactly how to cut it off the easiest way possible with basic hand tools. Before we start talking about the trusses and things like that, we're gonna talk about the rear axle that you need and what vehicle it comes from first. You have two options. You can get your rear axle from a 99 to 2006 GM 2500 or 3500. As long as it came from a single rear wheel vehicle, that would make it a corporate 14 bolt. And the other axle you can use is basically going to be the axle that was in the rear of that Ford Super Duty that you got that front axle out of, preferably an 05 to 2016, but there's some wiggle room there, right? You could go a little older, could go a little newer. It's not as big of a problem, um, but you know, typically it's pretty easy if you can find both sets. Now the benefit to the 14 volt, well, there's a whole host of them, so let's talk about it. And lucky for you guys, I have one of those sitting right here. Obviously the corporate 14 bolt is gonna have 14 bolts all the way around the diff cover. But like I said, other 14 bolts also have that. One of the keys that you're gonna look for is cooling fins on this axle. These fins on the top and the bottom side of this axle will tell you more than likely that it is the right 14 bolt. You're gonna wanna make sure it has these bolts holding the pinion in. Now this axle happens to be missing a few of those bolts, but the holes are there and obviously the other axle looks completely different. That is the 9906 corporate 14 bolt you're gonna want. You just have to be sure it's from a single rear wheel vehicle. And I'd also try to find one that has disc brakes. They do make disc brake conversions for the drum brake axles, but it's just an added cost and it's easier if you already have it set up this way especially if you're doing it on a JK and you need to put tone rings on the back for your wheel speed sensors and your anti-lock brakes. Now over here underneath the project CJ I'm building, there is an older corporate 14 bolt, but you can tell it still has the bolt on front differential area, but it doesn't have those cooling fins on it. And you can tell over there, that it's actually got drum brakes. Now the ring gear on a 14 bolt is 10 and a half inches in diameter. So it's 
really big and it's super durable, especially on a Jeep for something like off-roading. The other benefit is that it's gonna be a full float axle. What that means is these bolts here that you can actually get from stage eight locking fasteners to help make sure that they don't loosen up and come out on you during some extreme off-roading, it's actually gonna be your axle shaft. You could undo these bolts and pull the axle shaft directly and still drive it with your wheel bolted on. Obviously, you'd have to clog the end of the tube or your diff fluid would come out, but it's pretty nice because those axle shafts are real thick, real big, and they don't have the added weight and leverage of having the wheel bolted to them like they do in a factory Jeep. These 14 bolt axles are only a 30 spline axle shaft, but don't let that fool you because the spline count on these 14 bolts is a little different because the splines are a lot larger than a 30 spline front axle and the shape of the spline actually provides a great deal more strength. So these factory axle shafts can support a bunch of horsepower and torque. It's not even really that big of a deal or necessary to change them. As far as swap trusses are concerned, there are a number of companies out there that make some really good ones. And then there's a couple of companies that don't make them quite as well. well I'm not here to badmouth anybody, but I am here to tell you guys what to use and what's gonna be absolutely the easiest. Now, on my rig, I used Barnes four-wheel drive, but don't let that fool you because I have installed everything. I've installed Motobilt, I've installed TMR, I've installed Artec Industries, and I will tell you that all of these companies are pretty good, but the top two that I would go with would be either Artec Industries or TMR Customs, and here's why. My trust experience on this vehicle took me a lot of grinding and cutting on the truss. And even then, I'm not super happy with the fitment of it, but it does work. The steering I got from Barnes four-wheel drive didn't work at all. Uh, you can look that up on the internet. There's a bunch of people talking about it. So I went with high steer arms from TMR Customs and they work perfectly with this vehicle. This right here, is the West Texas off-road Redneck Ram, and it is essentially all you need in order to make Super Duty steering work on your Jeep. There's two big companies when it comes to doing steering on your rig, and there's West Texas Off-Road, who makes the Redneck Ram and PSC. Both are good companies, both make quality stuff. PSC's stuff is a lot more expensive, and a lot of people out there on the internet would try to convince you that you need a PSC steering box, which is a lot more expensive than your factory one, and that you also need their RAM. Now, PSC's box is pretty nice, I'm not gonna lie. They increase the pressure coming out of it, they do some nice things with it, and it works. The one thing that PSC offers, which is actually pretty nice for our community, is gonna be something called an upgraded sector shaft. Now that sector shaft is the little rod that comes out of your steering box that basically rotates when you turn your steering wheel. Now that rod is made out of a certain diameter and we all know just like our axle shafts that the bigger it is the stronger it is and PSC has upgraded theirs and made it bigger so that it can take more stress. But all that stress disappears when you install a ram on your tie rod, which you're definitely gonna need with a heavy axle and really big tires. So you don't need that upgraded steering box from PSC in order to make your hydraulic steering work well. And that's where West Texas Off-Road comes in. West Texas Off-Road offers you a rebuilt steering box, and that rebuilt box will come to you ported so that it'll have the fittings on it for your hydraulic lines and then they send you a ram. It comes with the tabs, comes with the bolts, comes with all the instructions. You weld the tabs onto the axle, you bolt it on, you bleed the system, and you're good to go. And the benefit of that is you're running a part, a steering pump, and a steering box that you can get from a local auto parts store. Now, most of you guys know that if you've been following me for a while or have subscribed to this channel, watch some of my wheeling videos that I was at Easter Jeep Safari in Moab in 2023, and we had a problem with one of our Jeeps, and the steering pump actually went. But because it was a factory pump running the West Texas off-road ram, we were able to run to an auto parts store in the middle of town and get that rig back up and functioning the very next day, which 
was pretty awesome because we didn't have to special order anything. We didn't have to carry a second one just in case your pump fails. And that's something when you're building your rig and you're building it to off-road that you need to think about, that reliability. After all, that's probably why you're thinking about ton swapping. And that's why doing something like the Dana 60 and the 14 bolt is nice. Using factory brakes is nice because those brakes are upgraded and the parts are available at auto parts stores. So when things do and will eventually break and wear out, you can get them fairly quickly and you can replace them, which won't ruin your expensive trip when you drive halfway across the country or completely across the country to go wheeling with your friends. Now we're gonna answer the age old question. What's it like to daily drive a Jeep on one tons? So can you daily drive a Jeep on one ton axles from the junkyard? Yeah, you absolutely can. You have the reliability. The unsprung weight actually does make it a little bit nicer to drive on the street when you hit those bumps and things. Things like pulling into parking spots, not as easy, right? Your tires stick out a lot farther than they would have originally, even if you did have a larger tire on your Jeep. And on top of that, it doesn't turn quite as well. You can see here, I'm taking this turn as wide as possible and the Jeep was barely able to make the turn into the parking spot. It did, but if there was a vehicle next to me, it might've been a little tight. Anything that's wider won't turn as well. And people get confused with these because they talk about how the Super Duty axle has a better turning radius. And it does when it's in a Super Duty. The problem is the steering box. The steering box on these Jeeps only rotates that sector shaft that controls your drag link so far, and it rotates it for a Dana 44. So when you put the wider axle on and then you customize your steering, it doesn't really work like a factory vehicle. Once again, you can see here the rig pulling into the drive through at a local bank. This is actually a pretty wide drive through and it fits, but there's not a ton of room on each side. But, you know, to answer the question of what is it daily drive like, uh, it daily drives fine once you're used to it, uh, especially if you don't drive it like a race car, right? Your steering response with that Ram is gonna be a lot slower. Uh, so waiting to the last second to do lane changes and things like that, you gotta remember, you're a lot wider now. Uh, you're also not gonna be able to have the, the, the steering response that you would have had with a factory setup. So, you know, all those things to consider, you definitely have to drive it like a rock crawler that you're driving on the street when you do the junkyard ton swap. I hope this video helped you in your journey to understanding one ton axles. And if you want to make the jump and do them yourself in your garage and get them underneath your rig, this channel is all about showing you guys how to build crazy, good performing rigs that are gonna be reliable and get you home at the end of the day, but more importantly, doing it on a budget in your own garage, yourself at home. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, definitely tell your friends about the video and stay tuned, because I know I didn't talk about the electronics portion of this video and this build, but I'm gonna do it in a future video and it's very simple if you use the axles that I talked about here. Anyway guys, get out there, build something.